When you hear Indian spirituality in the United States, what do you think of? Maybe it's yoga, practiced by 40 million Americans with the promise that your downward dog and pigeon pose is a part of a timeless repetition by countless people over countless years. Or maybe you think of the great guru boom of the 1960s and 70s as part of the countercultural movement, which made celebrities of figures like Mahesh Maharishi Yogi, seen here with Mick Jagger, Swami Prabhupada, and Krishna Consciousness, Allen Ginsberg in that photo, or Sri Rajneesh, now of Wild Wild Country fame. These gurus brought a new vision of spirituality to the masses, disillusioned by post-war consumer culture and a crisis of faith in institutions like the government. Or maybe you cast your historical eye further back still to Swami Vivekananda, who claimed to introduce Hinduism to the United States in his 1893 address to the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. But what if I told you that the story goes much further back? that it is embedded in the earliest American imagination. What if I told you that the fixation on Indian spirituality is at the heart of the creation of the United States? It would change everything, right? It would shape everything that came after. Long before Americans spent $20 billion on yoga paraphernalia and chanted Om on the, lo the Lulu lemon mats, Long before free love communes offered an escape from straight-laced Norman Rockwell normativity, the allure and the danger of foreign spirituality captured the imagination of a much earlier America. So how does it all begin? How exactly does Indian spirituality sit at the heart of the American nation? Well, the story goes something a little like this. In 1814, before Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau turned ancient Hindu scripture into the poetry of transcendentalism, John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson that he had become fixated on Oriental history and Hindu religion. Having served as the second president of the United States, Adams spent the latter half of his life in correspondence with lots of public figures, but especially Jefferson, who had been a dear friend and his vice president before defeating him in the 1800 election. The men actually don't talk to each other for 12 years after the election, and after this icy silence breaks, they write all the time about all manner of things, but especially about philosophy and spirituality. Jefferson and Adams, like Benjamin Franklin and James Madison, many influential figures of the time, actually, are deeply influenced by deism. Deism is the belief that God exists, but doesn't appear in human life through things like miracles or even in the form of formal religion. So unbound from more conservative, orthodox Christian beliefs, Adams and Jefferson were voraciously curious about faith. They read widely and debated with each other, with theologians, even with laymen. And they disagreed about almost everything. But the one thing they did come to agree about was a basic universalist credo that they recognized as rooted in the oldest known Sanskrit text from roughly 1500 BCE, the Rig Veda, more than 3,000 years after it was composed in Bronze Age India, Adams and Jefferson really thought about this phrase, the truth is one, sages call it by various names. This phrase went viral, sorry, amongst these men who helped to set the stage for the conquest and expansion of the United States. Because these men had actually never traveled to India, they had to rely on the writings of American scholars of religion, who, alas, also never traveled east, nor did they themselves read Sanskrit. So they relied on British translations of Sanskrit philosophical texts, like the Rig Veda, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita. These books arrived on these shores in the 18th century as part of a trade route that combined the two great holdings of the British Empire, the East Indies and the American colonies. So when these colonists turned independence, saw texts about and from India, they saw a kinship between those ancient philosophies and an American political future. The American ideal of the individual is one in which there is a sovereign being 
fully contained, identifiable, and self-governing. That being is the building block of a settler colonial motto that you know too well. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness, which in the 18th century actually meant property, is inextricable from the person who can acquire that property. And in the 18th and 19th century, that person was white, male, and free. He is a man who bows to the whim of no other being, who acts only through his own free will. So at the very same time that in America, the idea of the individual is becoming the essential part of political and social life, we have some of the most prominent individuals of the time entranced by a philosophical vision that is exactly the opposite. What is it that makes John Adams write to Jefferson that he had read everything he could find, every voyage, every travel log, every history? It isn't an interest in India, the place, actually. It's not even an interest in Hinduism, the religion. He is actually interested in a concept that underpins all of Vedic philosophy. It is the idea of a self that is pure consciousness and utterly one with the universal. It is a self that is uncontainable and infinite. In this philosophical vision, any concept of being an individual is an illusion. It's a misapprehension of your true being. The singular being of the American political imagination is impossible to reconcile with the goal of the Vedic imagination. That goal is transcendence. Transcendence is overcoming and becoming beyond the limitations of our physical existence, this material world, our entire scope of knowledge. So here is the dilemma. The philosophical ideal is totally alluring, and the material reality is totally destabilizing, especially to these men who helped to build laws and institutions designed to individuate and segregate. Free, sovereign, land-owning men on this side Slaves, free blacks, women, native peoples on this side. Private religion on this side, public secularism on this side. So maybe it's actually not that surprising that as they worked through what they understood to be the place of religion and law, or what we now think of as the separation of church and state, Adams and Jefferson looked eastward. This is what they said. This is Jefferson, oh, sorry, Adams writing to Jefferson. I dare not look beyond my nose into futurity. Our money, our commerce, our national and state constitutions, even our arts and sciences are so many seed plots of division, faction, and rebellion. Everything is transmuted into an instrument of electioneering. Election is the grand Brahma, the immortal Lama. I had almost said the juggernaut for wives are almost ready to burn on the pile and children be thrown under the wheel. Here we have two former presidents, drafters of the Inde Declaration of Independence, now both old men, fretting about the future of the country they helped to see into being. And the terms of their fear they articulate in the rituals and rites of a Vedic imagination. Its promise of liberation that they were so interested in also supplies the terms of their vision of tyranny. These days, we can see how American elections are playing out Adam's prophecy of sowing division, faction, sedition, and rebellion. The sedition born out of elections that Adams feared isn't quite what we saw on January 6th at the Capitol, but it's not that far off. Elections, the living practice of democracy, are for Adams all-powerful, like Brahma, and potentially catastrophic. The rolling juggernaut crushing children under its wheels was a favorite image of British colonialism. The word juggernaut is the anglicization of the word Jagannath, meaning Lord of the Universe, the name given for Brahma. Colonial administrators were obsessed and horrified by the annual Rath Jatra, a celebration of Jagannath, during which massive chariots were pulled through towns. 
that bodies might be crushed under those wheels where masses pulling and watching are too lost in a religious fervor, too lost in an all-encompassing moment, was proof for British authorities of the savagery of Indian idolatry. When John Adams describes a potential threat of electoral politics as the rolling juggernaut and the widow burning on the pyre with her dead husband, he's recognizing the enormous danger of a self that can be disappeared, whether into a group, another person, or even that limitless Brahman. The same Vedic imagination that produces transcendence also appears to produce in India, especially through the eyes of British colonialism, the crushing, uncontrollable force of mass psychosis. When we think of Indian spirituality now, we inherit this history of fear, fascination, and longing, whether we realize it or not. We see it in the warm reception of Swami Vivekananda in 1893, and yes, we see it in yoga. We also see it in how often Groups and figures who cite Indian origins are greeted with suspicion, criminalized, called cults. Why do these groups who espouse ideals of transcendence also seem to evoke fears of illegality and exploitation? This is a question for scholars like me, but also for the millions of people who find themselves obsessed with popular cultural representations of cults, particularly so-called Indian ones. Everywhere you look, Netflix docu-series, blockbuster films, true crime podcasts, and journalistic exposés. Pop culture is all over intentional communities, charismatic leaders, and secret rituals. They traffic in a delicious kind of fear because we keep going back, watching, reading, listening. We want to know about these secretive, dangerous groups that seem to offer so much and might potentially take away even more. My own fascination, as it were, draws back to a childhood in New England, where I was warned away from Hare Krishnas on the street with the threat that they might kidnap me. When, at home, we had a small altar with the very same icons that those dangerous people also worshipped. No one could quite tell me the difference. But even as a child, I had an inkling. It wasn't quite what they wore, ochre robes instead of blue jeans, or that they sang and danced in public. It was that blissed-out look in their eyes. You know the look, right? They were lost in something that set them apart, apart from me, apart from you, apart from the rest of normal America, right? I've been trying to figure out what that thing actually is, though, for decades now, and what we can see, actually, from this long view of history is I'm not alone. Written into the very fabric of American life is a shared longing, fascination, and suspicion with an Indian-inflected spirituality, which might offer to loosen that stranglehold of this singular individual. These forms of spirituality reveal the fiction that America had to have become this, a settler colonial nation of individuals constantly just seeking independence from one another. It might have been otherwise. So we go seeking, like early statesmen and poets, transcendence. And we're terrified of what might happen if we find it. Thank you.